here we are we're getting ready to squat we'll be using a, an interval timer this is 40 seconds of work 20 seconds of rest for eight repeats I, I started mark out with six we'll be working up to 12 or more over the coming weeks so I've, I've got it it's a customizable round timer on the on the blackberry which no one probably uses but it's really convenient not sure if he's ahead of his time or or, or behind now what's important here, and I'll, you'll just go watch this. Okay. It'll, it'll give you the five, four, three, two, one. So go ahead and get in, unrack it. And... So Mark's going real rhythmically, and he is going to lock out every rep. That, that brief moment of lockout is relaxation, and it allows the blood to flow, which is essential for this day because otherwise this can qu quickly turn into a lactic endeavor after a couple repetitions through the, the 40 second rounds. So the speed is, is fluid. He's thinking about optimizing his mechanics every repetition. So that's 40 seconds is up. He keeps his eye on the clock it's 20 seconds of rest and uh, just make sure you unrack it in time so that you can yep. go as soon as it gives you the zero how is this different than the other day that you had me doing the so on the this is the other day strength aerobics correct so the strength aerobic day as I began to mention earlier is of a, of a higher muscular demand. It's utilizing, as explained by Roshansky, the, the aerobic mechanism to improve strength achievement. In this, the case with Mark, we've gone with a very, very submaximal version of it to accomplish the, the, the specific fitness, the rehabilitation, the remodeling of his pec because of the slow yielding action. The, the movements are performed slowly, three to four seconds for the upper body, five to six seconds for the, for the entire repetition for the squat and the deadlift with really light weights, but the muscular tension really gets up there because of the amount of repetitions void of joint extension. So there's constant tension on the muscle. Whereas today, we want the relaxation so whether he's squatting, benching, or deadlifting, you're going to see complete joint extension. So he has a moment of relaxation. And, and, and all that's really significant for a power lifter is that you're doing some type of squatting motion. This does not have to be competition technique or with the competition barbell but what is essential is that the the mechanics of whatever you select to do are optimized and that you're focusing on how you're moving because it, it's it's the repetition of quality mechanics that builds optimized skill so it's the nature of what you're repeating not just a matter of repeating Again, the relaxation is very important. Just that brief moment when you see him standing up because it allows the blood to flow freely through the muscles in a way that is vastly inhibited if you do not fully extend the joints. So it's, it's the reason why you see bodybuilders rarely going to complete joint extension on a variety of movements because they want to keep the tension on the muscle. And so that's what we want on the strength aerobic day. But this is just purely aerobic, low intensity. This is still challenging. And you can see, you know, Mark's still feel breathing. the Chipotle coming up. <laughs> and 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 we'd have a, clearly we'd have a much a much more objective idea of, of of what level of exertion he's operating at. For instance, with a heart rate monitor. So short of using one, we, we, we adhere to the work rest schemes 
and Mark simply moves at a tempo that is manageable because he has an understanding of what the objective here is so today. It's not to, 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 to elicit some, some, some high level of acidosis, vomit, vomit inducing workload. That, that is not the objective for today. And the, the, the objective here is not in the weeks to come to use more and more weight. That's not the objective. It's simply to develop a, a certain level of fitness which, which, which Mark will feel that is achieved as the, the manageability of what he's doing increases. What's, what's nice about this for me is I can... Play around, play around a little bit with foot positions and stuff like that. Play a little bit with head positions and, and really learn what feels best for me. This, this should be a very important note. Anyone who's listening who is a sport coach, I, I, I choose not to make the distinction between uh, uh, strength coach, sport coach, because that, that's... The, that's a major problem in, in what, what I speak about a great deal and what I write about. As a coach of sport, and, and, and I state that aside from anyone who's purely just lifting weights, so if you're a, a, a coach of powerlifting or a coach of any other type of sport, it, it, it should resonate with you sharply the, the importance of, a, of effective warm-up and, and movement preparation. And, and mindfulness of the optimization of movement, the, the, the length of time of warm-up and pre-training should ultimately be fairly substantial, particularly the more rigorous the nature of the main part of the preparation that day. And unfortunately, in so many sports, and powerlifting is no exception, the, the, the idea of warming up or the, or the length of, of time that it takes to do what is important is often really, really in, insufficient, insufficient. A lot of times for me, I just go right to the movement. And uh, it's a mistake. I've gotten better, but a lot of times I just start with the movement itself. So what you'd find is, because again with Mark, you, you, have, you have to remember what, it, what his competition maxes are. And so, so for some of you, you'd be doing this only your body weight, maybe even supported, in which you were holding on to some form of an upright. Because you're thinking about what your level of specific fitness is on the exercise in addition to whatever type of resistance you're using. And, and because the purpose is, is aerobic capacity specific to the competition exercises, it's, it's not a question of increasing intensity. That's it? I think we're done? Yeah. So that was eight rounds. And so what he'll take now is uh, two, two, three, four minutes, and we go to the bench, same thing, and then we'll go to the deadlift. Same thing. Feels good. We're going to start the uh, bench press portion of this, and I, I think a lot of times you guys that have been following along the YouTube channel, you're used to me going to another Neanderthal for information. And a lot of those guys have been great. Eric Spoto, a lot of those guys have come through. They have a lot of great practical advice because they've been hammering it out for a long time on the bench press. But James has a completely different knowledge base than anybody else I've ever met. And he's able to speak in such a way that he's able to get me, Mark Bell, a meathead, to bench the bar and to bench it repeatedly because I know that it's something that's going to lead to a 611 bench down the road. So here we go. So it's the same thing. The 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off. This is the initial countdown. Go ahead and get in position. Final countdown. So he's performing the full movement. 
and he and he will extend the elbows at the top in order to have that moment of relaxation to allow the blood to flow the the pace that he moves at is it's up to him obviously now we're dealing with he's coming back from the pec injury so he'll be naturally more guarded initially and this is this is not to state that any of this again the end game is not intensification it's not that he's using more weight doing this work or that he's moving fast it's that it's it's sufficient to stimulate the aerobic process which if he was using a heart rate monitor we would want him somewhere between 140 and 160, 140 and 160, somewhere in there, beats per minute. James, maybe you can talk the people through a little bit our initial phone call of kind of me with the pec tear and you knowing me for years as a just a powerlifter living in my own little powerlifting box and why and why we're attacking like this fit level of fitness so it's important to understand what what fitness means and and what it means to be fit for a particular sport and, and so many of the criticisms that I've had for much of sport preparation is is a coach's clearly incomplete knowledge of what it means to be fit for sport or if it's a team sport fit for a position in that sport so in the case of powerlifting being fit for powerlifting is being fit for the competition exercises so being fit for squatting benching deadlifting working backwards from the nature of squatting benching and deadlifting to what is more fundamental means of ensuring fitness in those movements. So what, you, what you're seeing today is an example of specific levels of aerobic fitness as they correlate to the competition exercise. And this can be done with any similar movements obviously the most specific is competition technique with the competition barbell just with no weight could on it potentially or, be using dumbbells or something yeah like. could you, be, you could be using dumbbells cables bands that as a power lifter you want to be doing some type of squatting movement some type of pressing movement some type of deadlifting movement and it's good to have the variation so that so that you avoid a dynamic stereotype and any athlete for any other sport your coach should, should be in possession of the same knowledge if you are a offensive lineman in American football your fitness is not defined by some running activity it's defined by the actions of pass setting and run boxing and, and that's what you must be fit for so so your aerobic fitness must be defined by movements that support the competitive requirements an example of something that running does not So smooth movement. Obviously, you'll, 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 what you'll actually see is, is Mark's uh, te technique will actually change because as the thoracic spine and the scapula achieves more mobility, you, you won't see the forward rotation when, in, when the bar comes down because that's what's happening to compensate for his lack of freedom of movement. So as the weeks progress, we will uh, 
we would like to see an improvement in that. Yeah, part of that is because I, I kind of bench more up here. Right. And that's kind of where the pecs are yep. kind of stuck. So I got to bring the weight kind of more in here and lift the head up a little bit. And I actually squeeze and pull in and throw my bench press. It's a little bit weird. So again, the, the complete extension is really important for the relaxation, the brief moment of relaxation to allow for the blood flow, which is the same thing that you get if you're jogging or on an elliptical or an arc trainer, you're swimming, all these cyclical mo motions provide the opportunity for a, a brief moment of relaxation. And that's what we're achieving with these, the, 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 the repeated motions of squatting, benching and deadlifting. Can uh, somebody implement something like this just maybe once a week to get some improved results? Or is this something you gotta be a little bit, it's gotta be a little more frequent? Well, the answer would really be it depends. You, you have to see how you respond to it, to, to, to what extent you, are, you feel the benefit of it in terms of improving your ability to recover from the harder sessions. Yeah, what about restoration, you know? So do, doing this after a hard squat day or something. Right, so ultimately, pure restoration, what one could easily argue, does not involve any effort on behalf of the individual. That, that it would only be muscle stimulator recovery and sauna and massage. And, and that would be a plausible argument for, for others. Typically, what, what most people will find is the more heavily muscled you are as an individual, the more you tend to benefit from active modes of restoration because, because more mechanical energy is required to generate blood flow in the big muscles. Now obviously, if we're talking strictly about massage or a muscle stim unit, that, that works equally well on anybody. It doesn't matter how dense or massive you are. But in terms of if we look at pure passive means of restoration versus active means of restoration, it's a, it's a that was it, that was number eight. It, it's, it's, it's typically a common factor shared between most muscled individuals. <laughs> Sorry. To feel felt accomplished. <laughs> to feel more relevance with active modes of restoration versus passive due to what's required to stimulate those more massive muscles. It's a subjective thing. Right. So so again there'll be a couple minutes and then Mark will go to the deadlift. Deadlifting. So we're, we're on the deadlift now, and you can see Mark has some weight on the bar, and he, he's using this because he feels that he needs more than just the barbell to, to pull him into position at the bottom of the lift in it's such a position that he can get with a little bit of weight that he cannot get with only the barbell, and that has to do with his mass and, and any, and any oh. tissue restrictions. So we'll take a look at the difference. Legs are cramping up. Shows you how out of shape I am. But yeah, with this, you know, for me to get in any sort of real deadlift position, I mean, I can go lower, but what's gonna happen is I'm just gonna go like here, you know? So I guess that's not too bad. Yeah, I would actually, while, while, while Mark's subjective feeling is that he's much more naturally pulled down with weight, obviously, for obvious reasons, we want to go as low intensity as we can to achieve the result. And so because this looks fine to me. I'll just stick with it. Yeah, yeah. coach. And again, so he's going to stand up completely. And because of all these repetitions, I forgot to start it. That's okay. We'll wait for the next one. <laughs> Go ahead and just drop it. We'll call that number one. So there's a lot of repetitions here. 
And it, it, there's that much more reason for the optimization of movement to be secured, because this is a lot of reps, and we want the reps to be absolutely consistent with competition technique, particularly when he's using the competition implement. So he, he did not use it on the squat, but on the bench and the deadlift he is. So he should utterly be emulating the, the, the best of competition technique. Time to go again. There we go. So remember, we were just one ahead. And then we should actually have Vernon. I'm gonna set it on this when you're done. Because we don't want you bending over as far. No, no, set it on this. Oh, that's what I meant. So what, what I'm wanting Mark to avoid is any repetitive motion stress that involves the possibility of spinal flexion. So because the barbell without any discs on it re requires a level of mobility throughout the hamstrings and related musculature, I don't want Mark having to reach off of the floor and it potentially expose his lumbar region to flexion. Oh, he didn't want me to lift out of there. Yeah, just to... <laughs> okay. Oh. I didn't know what was going on there. Just, just so you're not having to pick it up off the floor. Right. Be because what, you know, what, what, what research is researches such as the, that those have, that have been done by Dr. Stuart McGill and others have shown is the consequences of repetitive motion stress e even via unloaded movement. So, so even if it's just bending down to pick up change off of the floor, if you, if you do that enough with a flexed lumbar spine, and especially if you don't have a particularly, which is a genetic gift, if you don't have a particularly thick spine, you're that much more susceptible to spinal injury. And so r regardless of how well genetically suited you are from picking up, for picking up heavy thi things, you should avoid compromising the integrity of the lumbar curvature at, at utterly all costs. Th there's, there's no instance in which we wanna see the curvature of the lumbar spine compromised. I've noticed uh, a lot of the guys that we know that hold world records, they move around like old men. I think for that reason that you're mentioning, Stan Efforting moves around very carefully. Every movement he does is like calculated. He's not going to like randomly pick something up like this. Right. He's going to do his best. You know, and for each person it's a little different, but he's going to do his best to pick stuff up the best way, to get up off the couch the best way, to sit the best way. Unfortunately, some people, it, it requires an injury for them to, to, to pay attention to how they move. So it, it's to everyone's advantage to think responsibly without having to be injured, to be more cognizant of how, what your posture is when you move around. That clock's broken. Yeah. So as you can see, you know, we're talking and, and Mark's not necessarily, he's not strictly adhering to the 40 second start, 20 second stop. The, uh, of course the objective is to do this, but we, we have to accommodate for the fact that this is not intended to become something other than an aerobic stimulation of his body. How have you used this in other sports? Have you used this on a track? 
have you used this in other so, fashions? Yeah, so, th so those who come from track and field are, are likely already familiar with the notion, particularly in terms of sprint preparation, of tempo runs, which, which the, the late Charlie Francis made quite popular. And, and they're, uh, clearly, they're not a necessity. They're not a necessity of sprint preparation, but they do serve a very useful purpose. And the concept of it similarly serves a very useful purpose for any variety of other types of athletes. So we extrapolate the, the significance of tempo, and this is one example of that for a power lifter. And, and there's an example for every sport in terms of what martial arts consists of and ice hockey and American football and wrestling and you name it. And there's a lot of good reasons for structuring the training in a high-low fashion so that you're not training intensively on consecutive days for reasons of optimizing recovery, achieving higher intensities on the high-intensity days. And, and the lower-intensity work gives you that much more opportunity to increase the volume of repetitions. So for those who are in the process of technical acquisition, the low intensity nature of something like this provides a lot of reps to secure movement efficiency. And you, and you can apply that to, to any conceivable sport that necessitates physical movement. Similar to, to those who have utilized tempo for sprinters or field sport athletes in the form of running, you, you, you know, and, and those of you who have done it yourself, it's, it's hard work when you're doing it. So just like Mark, you can see him, he's sweating, he's breathing hard, but, but what will happen is when, when we're done, uh, 20 minutes later, he, he feels like he maybe he, he wasn't even here in the first place. <laughs> it's, it, it, uh, well, especially once I get used to it, correct? Once the, once the level yeah. of fitness has been acquired specific to this activity. So it's simply, you know, you're sweating, you're working when you're doing it, you're breathing hard. But the quality of your work does not deteriorate, and nor should the effort required of you to sustain the pace that you start with. So these are good barometers for how you start and finish, it should be the same. You shouldn't have to be working harder to accomplish the same tempo of movement in the last repetitions. It should be the same throughout. If you, if you really feel yourself declining, you either were going too fast at the beginning, in the case of what's happening here, you were using too much weight. It should be the lowest possible weight. Even body weight, it's fine. If that's enough for you to do the movements, and you should be able to sustain the working intensity without increased effort. It should be, the, the beginning and the end should be essentially indistinguishable. So that concludes the, the, the main part of the session, squat, bench, deadlift. Again, you, you, you can see Mark sweating, he's breathing hard, but he's, he, he's not about to vomit. He doesn't need to lay down on the ground to, to, to maintain his consciousness. Think for yourself, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, he'll cool down now, void of just sitting. And, and for Mark, because he Not something people talk about much anymore. Right. And the, the reason... cool down has disappeared a little bit. Yeah, well, what, the, the, the importance of the cool down is we do not want to have a sharp declination or a sharp decrease from the working heart rate to the resting heart rate. We're not looking for that to be a sudden thing. What are some other benefits of a cool down? Like if I finish a leg workout and me and Marcus here wanna you know, squat 225 for reps or something, what's the real negative of just hopping in my car after we did breathing squats or something like that? So again, you, you have the benefit of minimizing the physiological stress by having a more of a graduated 
return back to resting levels. And apart from cooling down, we want to capitalize on something that I believe in that makes sense, is a certain amount of uh, stretching to, to simply just re uh, re the muscle tissue to initial states because the, the theory, which I think is a plausible one, is that blood flows more freely through a lengthened muscle versus a contracted tight one. And, and so by doing a certain amount of stretching after you've cooled down, w back to what you subjectively, subjectively determined to be resting levels because you know, you, you know you're doing your spot checks and you say to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm feeling that I'm back to normal, then you can th theoretically accelerate the, pr the process of recovery. Because so what very similar to like you walking through the door, you don't want to walk through the door and just start doing a bunch right of crazy it. stuff. You want to take your time, get yourself warm, build yourself up, then you have the main climax of the workout, the meat of the workout, the main event, as I like to call it, and then it kind of tapers back off again. That's exactly right, and, and that applies to every sport, uh, particularly those that require physical exertion. You know, we're not talking about, say, playing pool or chess in the context of sports that require this, these, these types of physical exertions that are of uh, any variety of intensities and types in terms of the nature of movement, it's, a, it's a no different than a story, a beginning, middle, and an end. So it's a graduated introduction into the main part and a graduated return back to resting levels. And unfortunately, we don't see this in enough sports. So, so we're looking to unify the process of preparation so that we're, we're no longer distinguishing between a sport coach and a strength coach such that this process of preparation is a holistic one and it makes sense from an objective point of view. There you go. We will, so, what, what, so literally, because Mark's fitness level, neither generally nor specific, is particularly high, you, you can literally just start walking around. You can and, walk around? Yeah, and what, and what like, we know we're sitting here, we, we were saying some things oh, on camera. Oh, would you like me to, like, so I should go through that door and then go left down the street and just kind of keep going. <laughs> just keep he just keep heading down that way. Just 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 keep going. And you're going to meet me down. You'll be, you'll be there, right? I'll be somewhere along the way. <laughs> and uh, again so again so the purpose of this is where someone who's really fit for the activity might actually do something similar to the activity they were doing to cool down. So so say a a highly fit middle or long distance runner might actually cool down with jogging a mile. Well, the thing is, because that's specific to their specific fitness, jogging a mile for an elite 5,000, 10,000 meter runner, marathon runner, is as simple as any of us walking around in terms of the, the physical exertion, which is not to say that it's the same for anybody going out and jogging a mile. So, so for Mark, so something like the difference between what he was just doing and resting levels, walking can be sufficient. And then once he feels that he's back to resting levels, and again, if we were monitoring the heart rate as an example, that would give us a more objective measure of what, what resting levels are. Then go into some stretches and uh, then we're done. But the, the cool down is important for a lot of different reasons and and I would certainly encourage anyone out there, regardless of what the sport application is, to, to adopt this way of thinking. Guys, this is James Smith, one of the best in the world. Uh, he's a hired hand. This is not a freebie. He's not somebody that, just because we're friends, we're, we're doing something uh, in trade. This is somebody that I hired for this special occasion of me attacking a 611 pound bench. It's not something I'm willing to give up on. It's not something I'm willing to trade for time or for anything else. I'm going after it with everything I got. This is the best guy I got in my corner to do it. And so I'm gonna fucking get it done. Time to stretch. That's it from Super Training Gym.